Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hello, I'm John. Great for al Sure glad to be here this morning. Uh, I'm nervous. I guess that's that to be expected, you know. Uh, what I'm going to uh, do on is acceptance. And uh, it's the biggest part of the first step. Uh, it, it, be, it begin, it's the beginning of being in control of my own life. I can have that control, that control today if I choose to work at putting the step one into practice. Uh, that was uh, hard for me. At first, I was a controller. I wanted to fix everybody. Uh, through this program, I learned that that wasn't the way. I'll tell you a little bit about uh, my past or at the beginning, how I got involved in Al-Anon. I started out as a child living in the home of an alcoholic uh, father, uh, and I have uh, three sisters that are alcoholics. I have one that died of alcoholism, a terrible way her liver went bad, and she got cirrhosis of the liver, and it was very bad. She was a great person, and I miss her. She died at 36 years old, and uh, buried her, and... It hurt a lot. I was only 13 years old because she was one I could talk to, I thought, you know. And uh, she was a lot older than I was because she died at 36 and I was 13. So you see the span of years that my father uh, had. He was married three times. He outlived them all. Uh, he outlived all the kids but the last three that are living now. Uh, now through the acceptance that I know through... Alan on, I don't have to carry all that guilt and all that, uh, that I wasn't a good person and that's why I was treated the way I was by my father. He was a very abusive person. He would, uh, I could never do anything right. Uh, and when he would drink, uh, I didn't have, uh, this program that knowing that, uh, I shouldn't get in there and argue with him. And uh, I was, uh, you know, I had to control everybody because I was the only person in the whole family that didn't drink. So I was thought I had to do that. And I did it well for years. I took on a couple jobs in high school. I worked through, I worked, you know, nine hours a day and still went to school. And uh, took care of my dad and my mother. My sister got married at 14. By the time she was 20, she had four children. I raised them and all of them. I'm doing it all. And uh, I met... Uh, this lady in school uh, is my wife now. I mean, uh, she was a nice person, but I had no interest in her, only that I borrowed from her things like typing paper and stuff like that to get me through school because I didn't have time to to do those. I had to work and, and do both. So uh, down the line we met. I uh, started managing a shoe store in a shopping center, and I, I, I kind of laugh at like the old story that you pick up somebody in a dime store. Well, my future wife was in a dime store, and we were having lunch together. And uh, we found uh, out, I found out she lived not far from me. And her dad had to pick her up. Well, I had car, a car, you know. Cause I, and, uh, you know, she said, you know, told me that. And she said, well, could you take me, you know. And I said, yeah, I'd love to. You know, I could, I could drop her off. So I started taking her home, and she wanted to pay me. And I think it wasn't very much, 50 cents or something, a trip. So I took that. And after a while, well, I discontinued that, you know what I mean. But uh, <laughs> it took me a lot of years. She was the first person that I ever got close to at all, and it took a long time. Uh, we even, I mean, this is how shy I was, because, I was too taking care of everybody else. I couldn't communicate with other people or had time for myself. So I uh, dated her well, at least six months, started dating her. I never kissed her once. 
And she thought, and the other boys, you had to push them off, you know, and I, this guy's odd. And her, you know, this, her friends talked her in to keep continuing on, you know, and I finally kissed her, you know, and, and that was an experience to me. And then, you know, I was a slow starter, but look out, you know, at the <laughs> quiet ones, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and, you know, I had, you know, a good relationship there, and I knew I had a good thing. I didn't want to lose that. Well, being a child of an alcoholic, you don't want them to see your other life, you know. I never took her home, never. I mean, no way. That was avoided like the plague. Because I knew she come from the right side of the tracks, you know. She lived in a brick home. I lived in a home with an outside John. And I had nothing. She had it all. I, you know, I, that's the way I looked at it then, you know. And I wouldn't be good enough for her if I told the truth about my life. And so I, I kept that up for quite a while until she just insisted, whether there's something wrong with me, you won't take me home to meet your mother, you know. Are you ashamed of me, you know. So I had to break down and tell her, you know, that uh, I don't want her to see what, what goes on in my home. I mean, if I took her home, my dad would come out with no clothes on or anything. You know, I mean, he did what he pleased when he drank. You know, that was his home, and he didn't have any. You know, so I didn't want her to go through that. She kind of understood, but she still didn't understand because she never dealt with that all her life, you know. So we went. Uh, I ended up getting engaged, and... Uh, Finally, she met my my mother. Uh, my dad never was. I mean, nobody ever saw my dad. My my mother was a controller too. Uh, she would lock him in his room when he got drunk. I mean, he wasn't allowed out. You know. I mean, she she did a good job keeping him. Uh, you know, out of sight and out of you know, and that uh, when he would come home. And a lot of times he got smart. He wouldn't come home until you know. He had to crawl home because he knew he was going to be locked away. You know? <laughs> so he didn't, you know. So even when we got engaged, uh, I'm an anonymous person. I introduced my wife at the her wrong name. <laughs> I thought it was that that shows you, you know, that uh, I've had it right at the beginning. I don't worry about me breaking an NV. I couldn't remember my wife's name, you know. And uh, well, anyway, we. We had her wedding, and her mother and dad at first didn't accept me and because they found out my dad was a drinker, and they thought, well, you know, you're white trash. And I was told that, and it hurt, but John proved them wrong. You know, I made an effort, and I, I know now that I'm not. And But anyway, they see through that now, the kind of person I am. And I, my dad went on and on, and even for our wedding now, uh, my mother came, and uh, I asked her, where's Dad? She had him locked in the room. I mean, you know, at my own wedding, you know, so I guess he couldn't come, you know, even if he wanted to come, <laughs> you know. And that kind of hurt, you know, but I understood that's the way she was. She did that. I mean, it was unreal, you know. And uh, we, so we got married, and we had had our problems because I was, a person raised in there, I didn't tell the truth. I mean, I didn't know what the truth was. To live in that alcoholic situation, I had to stretch it, uh, you know, be a conniver, get around it, you know, and you you get to be a pro. So I would never lie to Ruth, but I never told her the whole truth. I just tell her parts, a story or whatever's going on. And that really made her angry because she's a very honest person, always has, and it used to make me sick years ago because she's too honest. I mean, geez, this lady wouldn't, I don't think she would lie for her own mother, you know, if for anything, you know, and she wouldn't. And she taught me a lot at first, even without Alan on. I mean, it was a breaking in period for me to get over that. We went on and on, and we started with the son. And, and I never knew anything about alcoholism. I know my dad at that time drank a lot, and I just said he was a bad person. He didn't, you know, and I kind of hated him all these years, you know. And my dad lived a long life. Don't think all drunks die young. Uh my dad, I can't remember a day that he wasn't drunk. He lived 85 years old. Uh, but the last two years of his life, he didn't drink. It sounds crazy. He forgot he was an alcoholic. <laughs> he got so senile that he had booze in the closet. I couldn't believe it after he passed away. There was a couple cases of booze in that closet. And... Uh, but see, it was too late then. I couldn't communicate, and he didn't know who I was half the time. 
he recognized me, but you couldn't. How could you talk to somebody that got senile? So I never had an opportunity to really communicate with my father. And when he he passed away, I thought, oh, that's buried. He's gone. My problems are over with. Well, I have two alcoholic sisters. Well, they came in to the picture. They couldn't stand it. Me and my wife at that time had been married, oh, I think, 15 years, something like that. And we, we made it pretty good, and we had a, a good life, and they were jealous of it. This all came out, you know, then, because they've never been happy, because of it affected them more than me. The only thing I can figure out by with Alan on and all the help that I've got is why I was a little different than them, is I had a few friends that I went out with that a family took me in, and I used to do things with them, a normal family that didn't drink and they went to picnics, and I was included. This woman, and I still see her to this day. She's in her late 70s. And she took me in, and I got to do some normal things. My sisters stayed in that, never went, you know, and it affected them deeply. I know that. And I still pray for them. I hope that they will seek help. Uh, to this day, we, we haven't seen each other for about, I don't know, nine years, because I had to break away because they were out to destroy, and I had to realize, and that was an acceptance that was hard. Because I was a people pleaser. I wanted everybody to like me. I don't care who they are. And I learned through Alan, and I don't have to be. I have to be myself. And now I know the people that in this program like me for what I am, not what I can buy for them, what I can do for them. It's because I am a good person. And I've accepted that. This program has done a lot for me. And then came along in my life. We had a child that was, at first, first six months, he was a beautiful child. Then all of a sudden, he turned into a monster for all the way up till he was 15 years old. I think it actually started at 11. He really got bad. And we didn't know it. I was in denial because, see, I kept all this past away from him. He never really saw my dad very much, so he never saw him drunk. I thought, you know, I keep all this away. I didn't know that, you know, you can inherit that or it could be passed on. I said, well, I wasn't drunk. He didn't see me drink. He didn't, you know, on and on. Why is my child? All of a sudden, we find out. He's in the Army, he quit school, and I thought he couldn't do that, you know, that the Army would take him uh, without high school. Well, he got in there. And all of a sudden, he's gone four years and I never hear from him. He just disappeared. He didn't want nothing to do with us. And what happened is, he was in his alcoholism. He really went for it then. When he got in the Army, he had his freedom. Because I was in denial, and all these things that were right in front of my face, I, well, he's not, I'd rather have him drink than take drugs, you know, I was, you know, that old beer ain't going to hurt nobody, you know, and all this, and well, he started quite young, 11 years old, which I didn't know, friends do this when you go camping, oh, don't hurt him, slip him a few beers, you know, he started at a young age, so his really went rapid, and he ended up in the hospital, just like my sister with a bad liver, and they told him, well, either you stop or you're going to die, and thank God he chose to go on, he is in the program, and he's doing all right, but before that, I was devastated to come into Al-Anon. I, nobody's going to help me. I, I took care of all this, all these years, all these people. Why would I need all these crazy ladies, you know? Uh, you know, because the first time I went, see, my wife has always been one. When she finds out something, she goes for help now or finds out about it. And when she flew to California to see my son in the hospital, she went to Al-Anon meeting right then. She came home and she started going. She went to quite a few before she could encourage me to go. She says, you should try it, try it. So I went and, oh, you know, they were telling me stuff I didn't want to hear. You know, I'm a controller and nobody's going to tell me. Those, you know, old biddies aren't going to tell me. And that's just the way I felt, you know. No way. And, and I stayed away and I kept hitting it every so often, you know. Well, it took hold. And this program's turned me around. I have a new life. I am so involved that I have no time to worry about the alcoholic in my life, my son, right now. He's working his program. I'm working mine. And how I did that, I got involved with the convention the first couple years we were in it. And uh, that opened. We were chairman of uh, the uh, registration. And uh, that really got me involved. It got me a taste of service. And I really enjoyed it. I never thought I could do something. I found out John can do something, you know, because I had no confidence. Nobody, gonna, you know, I had that all my life. I didn't have it. So then I started going to more meetings, and now you can't keep me away. You know, I 
Then I did something I thought I never could do because I thought I was a failure at raising my son, which I know through Alan on now that I'm not. You know, it wasn't my fault. He had a disease and the things that happened. But I felt, well, I can't give anything to kids. So well, I started in being a sponsor of an Alateen group. And that has opened me up. I found a place that I'm good at. And I feel confident. And that I'm so good at it. I, You know, I'm not bragging, but I took on another group. I do two groups. One in Westland and one in Durban Heights. And I wouldn't miss those for nothing. I mean, it has to be something tragic for me to miss it. I broke my finger. I had surgery on my foot. I still made it there, you know. I, even while it was throbbing, but it's an important thing to me. It's made me grow. Working the steps with the kids and the program has opened my eyes, and they've shared so much with me and helped me grow. And uh, all I can say is if you want success in things, get involved, and you'll stop worrying about the alcoholic in your life, and you will you know, have a good life. I've used to be always waiting for my son to call and do things with me, and it never happened. Uh, and it still doesn't, but it doesn't matter anymore. Once in a while it does, and he does it because he wants to do it. It isn't because I'm there uh, probing him, saying, well, I'm your father, you should do this, you know, and things like that. And because I'll give you an example, I had a trip planned with him. Ruth was out of town, and my wife, and uh, so we had a three-day weekend. We were going to go fishing in our, in our, our motorhome. And had it all set. He, I sleep day, so I was sleeping up, getting ready for the trip to be all rested up. And he wakes me up at 3 o'clock and in the afternoon, pinching my toe, scared me to death. But he says, well, I, I have something to tell you. He says, I'm going to go fishing with my uh, girlfriend's uh, stepfather instead of going with you. Ooh, you know, that was something, you know, for me. It really hurt, but I didn't show it. All I said to him, I said, Jeff, uh, have a good time. The worms are in the refrigerator. You keep them in there so they don't die, you know. And uh, and borrow the fishing poles and go have a good time. So I left. So what I did when he left, sure, I was hurt. But what I did, I got on the phone and got to my sponsor. And I I discussed it. And what I did, we went out. We I got a bunch of people together. We went uh, out to eat. And then we went art fair because I'm into the art fairs. And I made a good weekend. We did three days of that, and I did all kinds of things. So what I'm saying is I've learned to have my A plan, my B plan. And you do that with alcoholics in your life. You can't depend on everything. They can promise you a lot, even when they're recovering. And a lot of times it doesn't follow through. And and I do that with the kids. If we can do that, we can have a happy life. I've learned to make John happy instead of trying to make other people happy. In the meantime, I've made the other people happy. I know. Uh, me and my wife get along better than we ever did. We've been married 26 years, and I'm grateful for that. I have uh, a better relationship than I ever had. We communicate now. We talk. Uh, we share the program, and it's a beautiful program. You should, all I can say is, accept that we can't change another person. The only person we can change is ourselves. And once I did that, I've changed myself, and I like myself. I love myself now. I never used to. And I can look in the mirror and say, you're a nice person. And I feel that. So thanks for letting me speak, and God bless. Thank you. Thank you, John. And uh, a very good message. And next one up is Jim. Jim Kay. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And I say, ladies and gentlemen, when I came into this program, I didn't think I was a gentleman. I didn't like Jim. And I'm supposed to address an issue of, of spirituality. Spirituality is something very special to me today. When I came in, I didn't think I was a gentleman. And the guy in my life at that time, I was raised as, in a Catholic home. And with all the regimentation, and here's my feelings towards God. God damn that son of a bitch, he did it again to me. And now I gotta talk about this. <laughs> yeah, really? Yeah. What do you say? Uh huh, that SOB, he did it. 
but it's a different thing today. The one time I couldn't think of anybody when I walked in you people, as Joanne said, she was in a thousand different pieces. I was the same way, like that old Humpty Dumpty. You slowly put me back together. I wasn't one of the lucky ones. I didn't come into this program and everything was easy. I fought you, people. I didn't want to hear what you said. Yeah, and I like what I see out here. There's a lot of men out here today. We're slowly taking over. Watch out, ladies. Because <laughs> I was in the program six months before I saw another man. And then when I saw him, I got a resentment. <laughs> He's cutting into my area. <laughs> and it was crazy. And I look at the changes that came about in my life. Like today, I know a lot of people out here. Because I'm throughout the state. I'm state allotene coordinator. And normally I have to get up here and plug allotene. And they said, today you got to get up here and talk about yourself. And most of my travels take me around the state. And I, my wife has a busy schedule, so I'm alone when we go on these places. Physically. Today i got to be careful. She's here. <laughs> It's nice to be together, to be friends. It's all as a result of you people. And I'm not going to qualify too much on an alcoholic. I got two of them in my life. I got my wife, who's in recovery today, and I got a brother, and he's still doing his thing. The reason, as he puts it, that he doesn't want to come to AA is because he doesn't want to hear this God. <clears throat> And you can fill in the blank, and you're probably right. And that's the way I felt when I came into this program. I didn't want to hear about this guy, because I was afraid, the fear, the terror. And all I could think of was that God was going to get even with me. So I put him aside. But when there was problems, and there was a big jackpot out there, I could cop a deal with him. Get me out of this or get us out of this, and I'll do this. I'll do that. And as soon as the pain was eased for the moment, I forgot the deal that I copped. And I was back to being Jim. Manipulative, controlling, a real pain in the... You know where? Not the, not, not the nice place. And I didn't like this program. I didn't like what you were saying, but I kept coming back. I was a glutton for punishment, and it scared me. You people talked about a God, a higher power. I wanted it, but I didn't know how to go about to get it. How could I ask for help from a God when I didn't want him in my life? I didn't, like as John was saying about the acceptance, I didn't want to accept the fact that it was a disease or I was powerless over people, places, or things. I didn't want to hear that. And it took a long time before I finally got the admittance from the head to the heart. It's a long 18 inches to drop. But once that happened, the spiritual part of this program started to change. And it's strange. I didn't know what spirituality was. I thought it was that religious, formal stuff. And when they said to pray, when I tried to pray, I would say prayers that I was accustomed to in school, when I was in a Catholic school. And today I call them the machine gun prayers because I would rattle them off and rattle them off, and the faster I would say them, the more keyed up I would get. And I'd just be in that. So I went back to being I, Jim. I was going to do it by myself. The ego was starting to take over again. I was easing the group out. I was easing God out. I didn't want the pain or the change. Many people used to tell me, no pain, no gain. I remember going into one meeting the one night and said, I've had enough of this pain. I don't know if I want to 
grow, as you say. In your words of wisdom, keep coming back, it gets better. And I used to hate that. I used to literally hate it. But I was a perfect people pleaser, so I would keep coming back because you sit home to. <laughs> and not many places would ask me back. And as I would keep coming back, I couldn't see any change because it's slow, so slow and gradual. But some of the pain started to leave. The acceptance started to come around. And without realizing it, I was able to trust you people. And through that trust, I was able to trust myself a little. With the yeah, but. I trust so far, and I yeah, but it. Because I would start to feel good. I couldn't handle the gratitude. Because I didn't feel I deserved it. And you told me to keep working these steps, using the slogans, go to meetings, use the fellowship. I thought you were nuts. And, but I kept doing it. I was like a trained little dog. i come in there and sit there and argue. And the one night at our group, my home group, Normally they have a big first step every week. There wasn't any newcomers there. And they took me back to our first step table. All these nice, gentle, young ladies and women. And they tore the flesh off my back. Before I left that night, they were slowly putting me back together. And they allowed me to go on to the second step. The second step gave me hope. And for the longest time, I thought I had the spiritual part of the program down. I thought I did the third step many times. I didn't understand the third step. I would ask. I'd allow God into my life, but I couldn't al allow him to do that because... I knew what was best for Jim. It's just like if I wanted to go to Chicago and I didn't know the roads to get there and I had a map of Detroit, I'd have a bitch of a time to get there. And he had the total map and he could give me the guidance through you people. But I didn't like the signs I was seeing. I didn't like what the way it was leading me. It was the eye again. And when I hurt bad enough, I'd ask for help. And when I would ask for the help, the pain would be relieved. And the trust would start coming back in again. And I could grow again. Things would, you could see the light at the end of the tunnel again. And without that hope, and that light at the end of the tunnel, it seemed kind of scary. But I didn't have to walk it alone anymore. I had a friend. And with this friend, I was allowed to take risks in my life that I didn't think I was capable of. How many of us tried to live up to your parents' expectation, your spouse's expectations, your boss's expectations, everything except what you wanted to do? Through this higher power, I've been allowed to do things that I didn't think I was capable of. I used to be in a room full of people and yet still feel totally alone. I felt just isolated. It's no longer that way. I can be in a room by myself today and not feel alone because I know I have a friend with me. My higher power, I laugh, I, he's always on my shoulder. And whenever I want to talk, I, all I got to do is just look over the other shoulder and say something to him. And he answers me. Through you people. And like John was saying, the Alateens, they made me work the program more. 
because I would try to use these big fancy theories and all these big words and all this stuff, and they kept it simple. Back to basics. What happened? I had to work on Jim. I had to work this program in all my affairs, which was hard. And the one night I was sitting at a table with a bunch of kids, approximately 7 to 11. And one of the kids said something that I could relate to. He says, you people talk about this God. Why should I believe in this God? When, I, when my parents told me there was Santa Claus, there was the Easter Bunny, there was the Tooth Fairy, and there's God. Then all of a sudden, as I get a little older, they tell me the Easter Bunny's a lie, the Tooth Fairy's a lie, Santa Claus is a lie, so why should I believe in this God? I can't see him either. And sitting there as a sponsor, you know, I'm thinking, what do I do? The best thing a sponsor can do is sit there and listen and allow the interaction of the group to take place. Another young boy got up, jumped up, ran around the table and tapped everybody in the shoulder. I'm thinking, what's going on here? And as he was doing it, he says, you, 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 you. And he says, every person I talk, touched here has a little bit of God in there. And I could see the good in each and every one of you. And he acts through you. Because I thought the spiritual thing would be great, big starburst and all of this stuff. It becomes a nice peace inside where you're no longer feeling alone. You don't have to do it alone, alone anymore. All you have to do is ask for the help, swallow that ego, and ask for guidance. At first, as I was working with the God, it was my understanding. It was just basically you people, and it was good orderly direction. By that good orderly direction, it allowed me the capability to allow a God of my understanding to come into my life. And they say, this is a spiritual program. You hear some people talk about spiritual steps. I can't see spiritual steps. Every step is spiritual. Every aspect of this program is spiritual. Each of our spiritual part of the program is a little bit different for each of us. What might be me feel good inside might not work for John, might not work for Bob. But we're allowed the opportunity and the choice to, to work at our own spiritual needs. And I'm finding my spiritual needs are ever increasing. Because earlier I said I didn't, couldn't accept gratitude. Today I've got a lot to be grateful to. How many of us have gotten up to look out the window this morning? It's a little gloomy out there, you know. You know oh, before I could have screwed up a good day on that one. That would have set the tone of my day. That's no longer true. I am grateful that I've gotten the opportunity to get up and see the day and do something about it today. Because I have choices today. And when I'm practicing this program and allowing God into my life, I am not capable of having a bad day. I can have hellish hours, hellish minutes, but when I ask for the guidance, I've got direction again. And with this direction, it takes away that pain and that insanity. And allows us to do things where we didn't think we were capable of. Like a year ago at this time, I was just getting out of the hospital with a heart attack. And in this last year, I've done things I didn't think I was capable of. At times, some of us are hard-headed on doing things. Reading the signs of, and doing what we want that we feel might be good for us. This last year, 
It's been fantastic. I've done things I didn't think I was capable of. I've gone back to school. I've made a career change. And I feel good about myself. I'm doing something I enjoy. Following my wife's footsteps. See, uh, Wednesday I start a new job. My wife had this job for, what, two, three years? And she moved on to another position, and I'm replacing her at where she was working. <laughs> Before, I would have never accepted that. So I'm following in my wife's footsteps, and it feels kind of good. And this God that's in my life today, he's my best friend. Because without him, I don't have anything. Without this God, I don't have this fellowship. Without this fellowship, I don't have Jim. Because I didn't know who Jim was before. You people allowed me the opportunity to find out who I am and to be what I really want to be. As I say, as the Alateen coordinated, when I took on that responsibility, they took and they found the biggest kid they could in the state of Michigan and they gave him a fancy title. And I'm grateful for it. I'm very grateful for it because it's allowed me the opportunity to grow. And I feel very fortunate on this panel. There's two gentlemen up here that are Alateen sponsors. I watched John. He didn't think he was capable of being a sponsor. I watched him come to workshops. He didn't take the risk to go try to be a sponsor. Now he's got two groups. I watched him down in Berea get up behind a microphone to talk about what the program did to him through these kids. You could see the tears in his eyes, the joy. Joanne, who spoke last night through service, we met. I watched her take that step. And today when she talks about it, you see the sparkle in her eyes. When she starts talking about the kids, she beams. And that's what this whole program is all about, because we have a tendency of taking something that's good for us and hoarding it. And i got to pass it on. When we pass it on, it comes back. Same with our higher power. He's giving it back to us, allowing us the opportunity to make mistakes if we choose to. But he's also there to put us back together if we ask for the help. And through this higher power, I learned how to be grateful. All gratitude for me today is, is my attitude. If I got a proper attitude and keep things in perspective, I'm going to have gratitude. And it's kind of nice to have something that you feel good about and look forward to doing. And it was all possible by the spiritual part of the program. And I have to laugh. Do you realize how, uh, what got us into this, as qualified to this program? Distilled spirits. <laughs> and distilled spirits got us here. And as a result, it's taken us and allowed us to feel good from the inside out. And I feel good from the inside out. And I thank you for allowing me to be up here. And I hope everybody enjoys the conference. Thank you. Thank you, Jim, for sharing that little part of your life with us. Uh, now it's uh, Tom's turn. I'll turn it over to Tom. Boy, these guys are tough. Hello there. My name is Tom. And I'm a super grateful alumni. My subject is the inventory stage of the program. Or as I like to call it, following the path to love and glory using the map of inventory. Uh, how about make your shortcomings long gone? Oh, bad jokes are one of mine. <laughs> but uh, I don't know... <clears throat> what they do in AA. But in Al-Anon, as soon as you set up an inventory table, 
you got to fight to get a seat because it's our favorite. Now, you see what inventory's done for me? I used to be a prevaricator. Now, I use the storyteller's embellishments. Now, can everybody hear me all right back there? That's good, because you are under arrest. You have the right to remain silent. If you give up that right, anything... Wait a minute. That's tomorrow night. I was under arrest. I was arrested for feelings of low self-esteem, for feelings of inadequacy, and for impersonating a martyr. Because I wanted to cure everybody else, and I didn't know what was wrong with me. I was convicted by my violent temper. I was angry and frustrated at myself and my insecurities. I was sentenced to life imprisonment by my fear. Fear of just what would or could happen if I tried to alter my life. See, I was used to failure. I didn't... I knew how to handle it. I didn't know how to handle success, so I didn't want to succeed. I was actually a success at my failures. I was secure with my insecurities, and I was at peace with my anger and frustrations. I used fear as a security blanket. It was my jailer. Now, if that wasn't bad enough, I found this ism. Alcoholism entered my life. The effects of it drove me right out of solitary confinement onto death row. I recoiled deeper within myself and threw up a protective emotional wall to, to keep from getting hurt. Why, well, psychiatrist would have had a field day with me. But a living organism grows or it starts to die. The only thing constant in life has changed. There is no stagnation. I was dying and I didn't know it. Then I found al -Anon. I'll skip over the reasons how and why I attended my first few meetings, but the first three steps unsettled my thinking and led me into the inventory phase of the program where the real work began. It was time to roll up my sleeves and get my hands dirty because I had 50 years of living to change. My cell door was wide open and I was free at last. This is how it happened. I sat down to a step four inventory table one night. The table leader asked me if I was ready to take my inventory to examine my faults and shortcomings. I said, well, let me go home and bring my wife back. She can tell you all of my faults and all of my shortcomings and just exactly what I have to do to turn into the kind of person she wants me to be. And after you hear what kind of a son of a gun I really am, you won't allow me back in any more meetings. But the table leader said, no, son, you take your own inventory. You make a list of your positive as well as negative qualities. Well, all right, I know what an inventory is. I worked for 20-odd years in grocery stores. I've taken lots of inventory. Now, to me, an inventory just wasn't an accounting of the groceries at the end of a fiscal period. It was an ongoing process. Because when I made out an order for more groceries, I had to inventory my present stock to see what I needed to restock the store. But most important, I had to continually reassess my present stock against the constant introduction of new products that bombarded the grocery industry. After all, the store was only so big, I couldn't handle each and every item produced. So I had to satisfy the buying public add new items, and discontinue the slow-selling obsolete items. The goal was to serve the public as best I could while making a profit for the store. No wonder I'm such a good people pleaser. I made a living at it. I'd like to share with you some of the eye-opening, attitude-changing ideas I found around the inventory tables that was such a revelation to me. Now, suppose I had a, a project or a repair job around the house. I would approach it by taking an inventory of my necessary tools and materials on hand. I'd see what I needed to accomplish my goal, make a sketch or a plan on how to do it, put it all together, and go to work. Now, the inventory phase of the program is similar. 
The goal is serenity, happiness, inner peace. The Al-Anon has a plan, has a blueprint. An inventory is the tool I need to help me discard my useless, negative, faulty shortcomings, take on the positive qualities that I need, and get to work. Another idea I found around the tables, you have to give up something to get something. It has to cost you something. Well, this priceless gift of serenity may cost me more than I'm willing to give. Because first of all, I'm going to have to give up my stubborn self-will. I'm going to have to give up all my hates and fears and prejudices and all my other harmful habits and desires. But that's only the down payments. The expensive part is I'm going to have to change the way I think about myself. Because my attitude toward myself affects my attitude toward other people. And I can't really like other people unless I like myself first. So I've got to find the real me and like him. Just what kind of an inner monster have I been carrying around all of these years? If I am my own worst enemy, then I've got to find him and turn him into a friend. Well, the step says, take a searchy and fearless moral inventory. I've come too far now. I've got to take the risk. I'll never win if I don't get into the game. And I'll never steal second base if I don't take my foot off of first base. There's, there's just no playing at safe. search paid off. I found him. He was that. It's been so long I hardly recognize him. He was that 18-year-old young man fresh from high school who wanted to go out and change the world. He wanted to make it a better place to live in because he was in it. Well, he was quickly discarded, lost, because all he had was a goal. He didn't have a plan or any tools or any material to start off with. So I brought him up to the surface. I couldn't help but like him. Here was my monster, my enemy, the real me. I'm not afraid anymore. My anger and frustrations and feelings of inadequacy are gone. It's been so long since I've lost my temper, I've forgotten. I'm at peace with other people now because I am at peace with myself. I can love other people now because I love myself. Another slogan I, I found was, you are only as happy as you make up your mind to be. Now, other people can only add to or detract from my happiness if I let them. Well, now that I accept myself as a normal human being, and it's all right to make a mistake once in a while and still like myself, now that I am in charge of my own happiness, I'll be darned if I'll let anybody take it away from me. I'm no longer at the mercy of the wind and the tide just floating along in life. My life has meaning and direction now. I can meet life on my terms. I can go out and challenge it instead of sitting back waiting for it to control me. I have found this serenity that the inventory phase of the program promised would be mine if I wanted it bad enough and if I was willing to pay the price. When I started out in the program, one day at a time meant surviving this ism as best I could each day. Then later on in the inventory phase of the program, I meant discovering more and more about myself each day. Now life is a new adventure each day. Because thanks to my higher power, the al program and all the wonderful people in it, I now know the difference between merely existing and the true joy of living. My attitude is gratitude, and now I know what this 18-year-old young man I found is going to do. I now have the plan. I now have the tools. I now have all the material I need. The goal is the same, only it's not to make this world a better place to live in because I was I want to help you. And the 
thousands and millions of others like us make this world a better place to live in because Bill and Lois W. were in it. I want to help you carry their message that a better way of life is possible through the AA, Al-Anon, and our associated programs. And when I see a newcomer walk into their first meeting, I turn into an evangelist, a preacher, and a snake oil salesman all rolled up into one trying to get that message across. But when they're ready for the inventory phase of the program, I turn into a Dutch uncle. Now, I don't hold myself up as an example of al anon because I'll never graduate or stop needing the program. Tomorrow, I could nosedive back into my prison cell, but today I'm free, and I've got to give back to the program some of what I've received. I need the program more now than ever, because now it's my turn to help somebody else, especially through the inventory phase of the program. So I'll continue to do a four-step inventory on myself periodically. I'll use it sort of a, as a spring house phase, where I'll get into the corners and hard to get at places. Socrates was right. An unexamined life isn't worth living. Mine is worth living now. And I'll continue to make a list of all the persons I've harmed and make amends. Hopefully, I'll be adding fewer and fewer names to the list to make amends sooner. Because I want my list blank. But step ten, I'll do daily. To continue to take a personal inventory and when I'm wrong, promptly admit it. So this step is going to keep me out of trouble. Because if I don't do it, my faults and shortcomings are going to grow and grow. And I'm going to be weighted down more and more each day until I'm right back carrying those same burdens. Till I'm back in that same miserable existence I was in before. And I'll be back in that same rut I was in before. And the only difference between a rut and a grave is a dimension. I was dying and al showed me how to live and I don't ever want to forget that. But right now, I want to use this inventory key to help unlock others suffering from this ism and introduce them to that wonderful, dynamic, happy person they really are who is just waiting to be set free. Once again, I'd like to thank my higher power, the all Non program, and all the fantastic people in it for helping me to discover the joy of living. See you at the inventory table. Well, thank you, Tom. That was some speech. And I think Charlie's got his uh, work cut out for him. But uh, <laughs> Don't go fishing now, Charlie. It's raining out. <laughs> this is Charlie. Hello, I'm Charlie. When I got this assignment from Gail and accepted it, they said I was going to speak on the action phase of the program while the old Charlie was still looking for step 13. <laughs> but his book said, and I've learned through this program, that I have to read the book each word. And it said, having had a spiritual awakening, that meant for me one thing. I had to learn a new four-letter word. Help. I had to recognize that I was really powerless over persons, places, things, and situations. And included in those things was alcohol. I had to overcome the fact that I was dropped off on the Lower East Side in 1942 during the race riots to a grandmother that drank, dropped by a mother who drank, who was divorcing a father that drank. And I had to recognize these things, and I carried those things for 44 years. In that time, I grew up not too happy. I found out one thing. I married one woman that drank on Thursday nights, and it upset me. That one ended in a divorce after 15 years. Married a second woman that drank a little more than the first woman. That one lasted seven and a half years. 
And I got married a third time because I still hadn't uh, really understood what made Charlie tick. I married a lady that was in 40 treatment centers, disclosed that to me, and was still drinking. I married her anyhow. That married lasted about 20 months. I divorced her on the 65th treatment center. I'm very grateful I met that lady, though. The reality was, I finally reached my bottom. I had to do it with almost a total nervous breakdown. But that's okay. And then I had to walk into al -Anon. Matter of fact, the facility in downtown Detroit on Elizabeth Street suggested that I go to al -Anon. I couldn't understand why anything was wrong with me. And I fought that, but I found out. I had to sit with a bunch of ladies and hear about al -Anon. And I, I, I affectionately call these ladies today the tough old bras of the program because they listened to my garbage. And they were there, and they were patient. And finally, I found a man in the program, and I asked him to be my sponsor. Fortunately, it was early in the program. And that man was six foot tall, weighed 350 pounds. And he kept pounding it into me when I would call him. You ain't accepting, boy. And how I hated to hear that, but I would still make the call because I knew I needed some. So I believe that that was the beginning of my spiritual awakening. I've had so many spiritual awakenings since I've been in this program. They're too numerous to mention. But I find that every time I have a spiritual awakening, I stop and ask my higher power for help. And you know, it's no mystery to me where I get my answers. I learned how to take the cotton out of my ears and put it in my mouth with that sponsor. And I get my answers at the tables from you folks. And I'm looking over this audience today, and I see that I've shared tables with more than half the people in this room, and this is just like talking at another table for me today. I'm very happy you showed up in such great numbers because I can feel very comfortable talking to my special family today. And then I had to get into the defects, you know, the seven deadly th sins and the shortcomings. That's when I fall back into those seven deadly sins. You know, I had a lot of pride. I didn't want to admit I was wrong, but I had to learn. And I had to learn through the inventory that Tom spoke of. And I had to recognize the ism within me that caused me the problem. Today, for me, alcoholism and my dealing with it is just a great disease called blame. If I could blame you for something that went on in my life, I was very happy. I was very happy. Because then I didn't have to accept any responsibility. Today, I have two sponsors. Those two fine gentlemen are very tough program people. I make a call. I know what I'm going to hear when I call. You ain't accepting, boy. That's when I have a problem. But the nice thing about it is those two sponsors are very good friends today. And those two friends ask, how do you feel? And I know they mean it. And I know each and every one of you out here in this room ask, how are you doing today? You mean it. Because there's feelings. And those feelings are what I like to use to carry the message to others. The good feelings. I carry the message to others just by my attitude. If I feel good, and I'm not upset, and I'm not nervous, I can carry a message. I found that's true. I saw it at one of the meetings I go to. It says, practice the steps. Don't preach actions, not words preach. And I've taken that and I ran with it. And I've ran a long way. And it's only because of you folks out there. And I've done a little bit of service work. And I do a little bit of, as time comes and goes. I do what I can do to make me feel good. 
And if it means sharing with any one of you, that's what makes me feel good. Because if I could do that, I would be the same old thief that I was in the beginning. If I don't give it away, I can't keep it. And if I would get well and go back into a closet somewhere and say, I don't need these meetings, I would be a thief. And today I don't want to be a thief. Today I just want to be Charlie. And the third part of the 12 steps, which is the action phase, says, and practice these principles in all our affairs. I live the steps today, and they work for me. There was a day that I had to learn how to work the steps. Today, I live it. Today, it is very easy to enjoy a day. I can remember last night being stuck over in Fairlane because the Tunerville trolley wasn't going to run because it was windy. And that was a test of humility and tolerance in my daily living. I've learned that from a nice young lady in the program that every time I give her a pot shot, she comes up and kisses me and hugs me and says, practice humility and tolerance in our daily living. And I think I need to learn town now just to get the hug. But that's the way the program works for me. Serenity is neat. I know we're running out of time, Bob, so I'll be quick. Because today is just another good day that I could share with my friends. God bless you. I love you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.